So here I was trying to write a script for a video I was making on so-called Kessler syndrome. The idea behind the potential collision somewhere out there in outer space, creating so much debris that no other satellite is going to survive. This is of course the premise of the movie Gravity that we've discussed many times on the channel before. And just so happens, ironically, as I was writing this, NASA released this. The image that shows us that the pride of my country, the Canadarm, was recently hit by some kind of a piece of debris from one of the satellites that was actually not tracked by anything and that was previously unknown to us. But despite the size of this hole, luckily enough, nothing major was hit and Canadarm still operates as expected. If you didn't know, this is actually the tool that um, the International Space Station uses to move things around from inside the craft and also something that is used to usually attach various components to the International Space Station. It was also a component used inside the space shuttle and is also often used in various EVAs or extravehicular activities. Normally the astronaut is attached to the arm and the arm is controlled by someone else from the outside, with the arm sort of used as a kind of a propulsion. But this hole right here serves as a stark reminder of something that is slowly becoming worse and worse, another pollution problem, but this time space pollution, with collisions increasing pretty much every single year, and some of these collisions are from really tiny pieces that nobody knew existed. And although the first satellite, Sputnik 1, was only launched in 1957, in the last few decades we've sort of once again started to kind of bubble up. We've created a new bubble. This time the bubble of various space launches with this graph from the European Space Agency helping us visualize how bad things are going to get really soon. Now this is just last year and this number is only going to increase in 2021 with this graph right here also showing us how the total number of objects depending on the altitude has also increased quite dramatically in the last decade. And unfortunately, so far, it really only seems that ESA is the only organization in the world that seems to take this extremely seriously. As a matter of fact, ESA is the only organization I know that has been releasing these videos for the past decade. They've been trying to make this point every single year, several times a year, and creating these beautiful simulations and visualizations to help us understand how bad this problem is going to get. Here's for example one of the recent uh, infographics they made showing us the average time the satellite is expected to survive in a certain orbit depending on the altitude. So for example anything below 500 kilometers is expected to deorbit within about 25 years. And that's because this is a layer known as the thermosphere where there's still a little bit of atmosphere, just tiny amounts, that does produce a little bit of drag that forces objects like International Space Station to occasionally boost their velocity in order not to fall back to planet Earth. But above that we reach the layers of exosphere and then outer space, where the drag is much lower and because of this things will take much much longer to deorbit. And in their cute infographic they even suggest that if dinosaurs back in the days launched some sort of a satellite into geostationary orbit, it would still be there today. It would take millions and millions of years for these satellites to deorbit and to crash back into the planet. And so because of this, um, a few decades ago, various organizations in Europe and in North America agreed on certain requirements for rockets and for satellites before the satellite gets into orbit. So for example, every satellite today has to have an ability to release extra fuel and get rid of the extra energy at the end of its activity. Also, a smaller satellite has to find a way to deorbit itself and to crash into the planet in order not to produce extra debris. Whereas the larger satellite in this case a satellite in the higher altitude has to find a way to reach the orbit level known as the satellite graveyard, which is located about 300 kilometers above the geostationary orbit. And this is essentially where a lot of older satellites are placed in order to avoid any potential collisions in the future. And some of the bigger satellites that are in the lower orbit have to have an ability to be still controlled at the end in order to have what's known as the control descent so that eventually they can crash into the region of the Pacific Ocean, also known as the satellite graveyard. This is the region where a lot of satellites and a lot of larger spacecraft are usually disposed of at the end. But of course not everyone has been obliging by these regulations and also some of the older satellites that have been launched in the 70s and the 60s are still in space today and we know that at least one major collision has already occurred back in 2009, the collision between two satellites, one active and one inactive. This was between the commercial Iridium-33 and the military Cosmos-2251 that was tumbling across space and not being controlled by anyone. And 12 years ago this created so many different debris particles that even today it's still causing a lot of problems to some of the other satellites. 
But what a lot of people don't know is that there are actually other well-known collisions out there. The first official collision of a satellite with a piece of debris was back in 1996. This was a French satellite illustrated right here known as Ceres. And this damaged satellite is still in orbit today. You can actually see it right here um, on this website known as Stuff in Space. Another more recent and somewhat sad collision story is from 2013. And this one was of two Cube satellites from two countries that were trying to launch their first satellites. We have the Argentina's Cube Bug 1 and Ecuador's Pegaso satellite. Both of them were actually launched successfully and operated for quite a long time, but back in 2013, they accidentally passed very close to the debris leftovers from the launch in 1985. And in this case, it wasn't even a direct collision. It was just what's known as a glancing blow. The object here passed relatively close to these smaller CubeSats, and it looks like some of the debris from the launch, probably some fuel leftovers or possibly some other particles, hit both of these CubeSats really hard and they ended up spinning around and being lost essentially. But unfortunately, some of the largest amounts of debris and some of the most dangerous orbital particles created to date were actually from the missile tests, or more specifically, anti-satellite missile tests. And here we have this one from India in 2019 that ended up creating quite a lot of debris in the lower orbit. And this is, of course, a test of technologies where the nation is trying to destroy someone's satellite in orbit. But in this case, India used its own satellite that was no longer operational, and by destroying it, it created a lot of debris. But the more dangerous test of this technology was from 2007 from China. The rocket test that destroyed the satellite right here, known as Feng Yun 2, and that ended up creating a huge amount of particles in the altitude between 800 to approximately 1000 kilometers. And unfortunately for us, these particles are going to stay there for hundreds of years. It's going to be really difficult to remove them. And one of these particles is already known to have collided with at least one satellite. The satellite that looks like this. This is known as Blitz, or Ball Lens in the Space. And this was essentially a kind of a retro reflector satellite meant to reflect lasers coming from Earth in order to establish distances and collect various types of data about planet Earth. But unfortunately, a piece of the Chinese debris shattered the satellite completely, and in this really cool project, pretty quickly. Now, you can actually read more about this in one of the links in the description below, but the main point I'm trying to make here is that this kind of stuff is going to be happening more and more as more and more debris is created every single year with various commercial launches. Or in other words, we're coming closer and closer to reaching that threshold for the so-called Kessler syndrome. The syndrome, of course, referring to the idea where we have so much debris that it essentially starts to multiply itself. It starts to collide with other satellites, which explode and create more debris, which then explode and create even more debris. With all of the current simulations suggesting that we're going to actually have so much debris in space in just a few decades, that it has a very high chance of ending our ambitions for becoming an interstellar species while also ending all of our space technologies as well. Now, because of this, for many years now, as I mentioned before, ESA or ESA or European Space Agency has been vigorously planning different missions. Now, the problem right now is that there's just no funding for it. When it comes to launching satellites, we have a lot of different commercial contracts and very successful contracts where you can actually make a lot of money launching someone's satellite into space. But unfortunately, deorbiting these satellites or more importantly, cleaning the debris that was created over the last few decades has no money in it. There's absolutely no funding. And because of this, there's very little interest. There are very few companies currently working on various projects, but one in Japan that I'm going to try to interview sometime in the future. But for the most part, right now, it's all very theoretical. And as of today, there are very few missions planned. What the only company doing anything is really being European Space Agency. For example, they're going to try testing various solutions such as possible parachutes in order to help the satellite re-enter orbit sooner, or inflatable balloons that can pretty much do the same, and possibly testing other technologies such as other satellites that can either refuel another satellite or help it deorbit by pulling it back to Earth. While also testing some other things like harpoons in space, different nets or different claws that can capture objects as well. Now, nothing has been physically tested just yet. All of these are just concepts for now. But because there is just so little funding and because there is so little interest from commercial companies to do anything about it, unfortunately, graphs like this are a stark reminder that it's more likely things are going to get worse before they get better. 
And because today we directly depend on satellites to function, a lot of our technology depends on it, preventing this Kessler syndrome from happening is right now one of the biggest priorities or should be one of the biggest priorities for all organizations and all commercial entities out there. And though I guess to some extent there are a lot of things that we admire about companies like SpaceX and their ability to push the envelope, unfortunately they're part of the problem right now, they're not part of the solution. Now if you're interested about the actual numbers and the statistics of these various collisions, you can check out the ACES link in the description, but the idea here is that we have about 12 different collisions per year, normally between various particles left over from propulsion, from fuel, and various other larger chunks that also orbit but no longer function. At the same time, in order for us to avoid overcrowding all of these orbits and creating the conditions where nothing can be launched anymore, JAXA, the Japanese space agency, which is also sort of working on some of the solutions, discovered that we need to remove at least five large objects per year in order to avoid the potential Kessler syndrome from happening and from all this going beyond our control. Now, unfortunately, right now, these are just theories and just calculations. There are still no practical, actual physical solutions, but more importantly, Right now there's just no funding, no money in this. Cleaning someone's trash and cleaning someone's junk in space has absolutely no value to any corporation out there. Unless, of course, they start losing money by losing those satellites. And so unfortunately, that's kind of where we are right now. I feel like when we finally lose a major satellite that belongs to some major telecommunication corporation, I don't know, Verizon, AT&T, you name it, then they might start caring about this and providing actual money for the cleanup as well. But until that happens or until something major occurs in space and we have to start producing finances for these uh, cleanups, unfortunately I do not see this changing anytime soon. At the moment, just like with recycling, this is a huge problem right there in space. The problem that this image right here illustrates perfectly. It's getting closer and closer to the point where these collisions might become so frequent that it's going to be impossible to live in space. And so I guess in that sense, well, first of all, we might have to push for governments to start creating funding and money and finances for these missions to become a thing pretty much every year. Trying to clean up the orbital space and trying to deorbit some of the larger particles has to become something that happens every single month almost. But at the same time, we now also have to push the commercial companies, here we talk about SpaceX or other companies that are trying to join the space race, to become more responsible for basically cleaning their own mess. They should not be leaving any fuel in space, they should not be leaving any debris, and all of their satellites have to have an ability to deorbit within just a few years after their mission is finished. But that's not happening anytime soon. As a matter of fact, back in April of 2021, which is only a month ago from when I'm making this video, two satellites from two private organizations, SpaceX and OneWeb, almost collided. Now you can read more about exactly what happened from this FCC filing that yeah, you can find in the description below. But from what this filing tells us is that there's already quite a lot of controversy about these corporations struggling to collaborate and to communicate with one another. And they required interference from the FCC to try to settle all of these matters. And this right here is just the beginning. As more and more satellites become operational in space, satellites that are not controlled by a government but are controlled by corporations, this is going to become an even bigger problem. Which also means that I guess we find ourselves in a somewhat tricky situation. It's, I guess, great to have satellites that can provide faster internet, but at what cost? Anyway, so right now there's no resolution. The only resolution I'm hoping for is that let's hope that someone figures out how we can commercialize this industry, the industry of cleaning the orbit of our planet. Whoever is able to somehow find a way to finance this and to make money out of this is most likely going to save us from the inevitable doom of no space exploration and definitely deserves some sort of a major price in helping lead our society to a better future. Now maybe it's you, definitely not me because I don't think I'm smart enough, but I personally think that people like Elon Musk or other billionaires have more than enough funds and resources and know-how to make this happen. And just the fact that they haven't well, makes me respect them a little bit less. I mean, if I had a few billion dollars, I would probably spend at least one billion building a really cool cleaning apparatus to make space a little bit cleaner for other companies. If anything, just to brag about it, not even to make money. And so on that note, if you'd like to donate so that I can make that billion, uh, yeah, there is a PayPal donation box in the description. But anyway, on that joking note, um, well, that's pretty much all I have for you. The International Space Station got recently hit by a tiny debris that created a relatively large hole. 
And this hole right here is a stark reminder of what's yet to come in the next few decades. Anyway, on that note, thank you for watching, subscribe if you haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and check out all of the relevant links, all of the relevant documents, and of course, all of the videos I used in the description below. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Either way, stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.